This video is going to be all about inscribed angles. Now, up to now, all we've talked about regarding angles and circles are central angles. And remember, central angles had a vertex at the middle, right, the center of your circle. Now, these inscribed angles are different. They're going to have their vertex on the circumference of the circle, and they're created by two intersecting um, chords or secants. So let's go ahead and jot down that definition. So once again, an angle with its vertex on the circumference of the circle, which is different from that central angle because we're going all the way to the circumference of the circle, pulling it back, and then created by two intersecting chords or secants. So let's go ahead and draw an example. So you'd basically just have two chords, something like this, right? And they'd meet at on the circumference of your circle. So we can call this A, B, C. So this angle A, B, C, is an inscribed angle. And we're going to have uh, a few theorems we're going to talk about uh, regarding how to figure out stuff with these inscribed angles. But it's going to all come, going to boil down to the first theorem, the inscribed angle theorem. Before we get there, there's a couple more vocabulary words that you're going to want to be familiar with here. So we can have our inscribed angle create an arc, and that arc is called the intercepted arc. So we're going to be looking at this um, arc that kind of is the mouth of your angle. So if you look from A to C, this arc is created by that inscribed angle. That is the arc that we call the intercepted arc. So AC is the intercepted arc. All right. And then finally, we can also have a chord subtend our inscribed angle. And basically, that just means the chord that's created by the um, two endpoints of the legs of your angle. So if you connect A to C, and you see how this is the chord connected to that arc, that's the arc, the chord that subtends the angle. So we'll say the chord AC subtends angle ABC. And you might see that in some directions, or you might hear it described that way. So you just want to make sure if you need to draw it out, you know what that means. Okay. So our first theorem, the inscribed angle theorem, which is basically the foundation of all the other theorems we're going to be talking about today, basically says that the measure of your inscribed angle is one half the measure of its intercepted arc. Okay, so you want to make sure you're jotting that down. So you see how this is different from the central angle. The central angle goes to the middle, so it's the same measurement as your um, arc, but now we're pulling it all the way to the circumference, so now it's one half. So if we keep using that picture, we can say the measure of angle a, B, C is one half the measure of arc A, C, that intercepted arc, okay? Now, a corollary that relates to this says that if, the, if, an inscribed, ang if inscribed angles intercept the same arc, then they are congruent. And that, again, just makes sense because we'd have the exact same arc. So let's scroll down and jot that down. Again, if inscribed angles intercept the same arc, then they are congruent. So what would this look like. Um, for example, if you had a circle, and let's say we had one inscribed angle, A, B, C, and a second inscribed angle, A, D, C, um, you'll notice how they share the same intercepted arc, that same A, C. That means they'd be congruent. So we'd say angle a, B, C is congruent to angle A, D, C, okay? So that's a corollary that just kind of relates to that inscribed angles theorem, but let's go ahead and use that theorem to talk about example one. So I want to go ahead and find the measure of X, and you know what I realized? I totally forgot to give you the other value. Um, so this value, HI, is 4X minus 6 degrees. So let's pretend that I wrote that down already. All right. So if we have HGI is x plus 5 and HI, that arc, is 4x minus 6, what's that relationship? Well, hopefully you remember that the measure of your angle, HGI, is equal to 1 half the measure of the arc, HI, by your inscribed angle theorem, right? Again, if it was at the center, then they'd be congruent, but because we're all the way out to the circumference, it's going to be 1 half. So let's go ahead and substitute to solve. So x plus 5 is equal to 1 half of 4x minus 6. Now, again, just be careful with your algebra. Make sure you distribute that 1 half. So we'll get x plus 5 is equal to 4x. Or sorry. See, I didn't even distribute there. Easy mistakes to make. So be careful with that. So we want to make that a 2x 
um, minus 3. And then we can solve, right? So I can subtract x from both sides, add 3 to both sides, and x will equal 8. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to the next theorem, which relates to, again, inscribed angles, but one inscribed angle in particular. So we're going to look at what happens when we go through a diameter. And you may actually be able to think about this. So let's say we have a center A here, and we create an inscribed angle that happens to have endpoints on the diameter. So let's call that x, y, z. Take a moment and why don't you think what the measure of that angle y would be based on the idea that x, z is a diameter. But hopefully you guessed that since your diameter cuts your circle in half um, and that's 180, we divide 180 by 2 to get a right angle. So you notice this is a biconditional because it has an if and only if, which means it goes both ways. So we can say if um, x, z is a diameter, then the measure of angle x, y, z um, is 90. Or we could actually just say angle x, y, z is a right angle. Let's go that way. But remember, since it's, by my condi it's a biconditional, it goes both ways. So we could also be told that, hey, if angle x, y, z is a right angle, then xz is a diameter, right? Because that's what makes a semicircle. So that one's a pretty clear one. Just make sure you check for that dot in the center. We need to make sure that's a diameter. So if you take a look, AC, oops, right here is a diameter. Oh, geez, sorry about that. Here we go. So that AC is a diameter. How do I know? Because it goes through the center point. So what does that tell you about the measure of angle B? Well, hopefully you remember the measure of angle B will be 90 because it should be a right angle. So I'm going to say 5A plus 20 equals 90. And then I can solve for A and get 14. Right? Pretty straightforward. All right. Let's go on to our final theorem and round out these notes. So now, again, um, just using our inscribed angles and stretching that a bit. So now what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about a quadrilateral that's inscribed in um, a circle. So that means we want to have four angles on the circumference. It doesn't have to be a square. It doesn't have to be a rhombus. It could be any kind of quadrilateral. So you see I'm drawing a very irregular shape here. And let's call this A, B, C, D. And what we want to think about is we want to think about um, what the relationship is with these angles. And if you had time to explore, you might be able to come up with some ideas. But the theorem basically tells us that the opposite angles are going to be supplementary. All right, and that's our final theorem. So remember, opposite angles are angles that are across the diagonal from each other. So for example, angle B and angle D are opposite, right? Angle A and angle C are opposite. So here we would be able to say that the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle D equals, remember supplementary is 180, think S for straight, um, and then the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle C equals 180. And remember all four together add up to 360 because it's still a quadrilateral. All right, last example, let's round out our notes. Take a look at example three. I want you to find the measure of angle H, which is this big question mark. How do we figure that out? Well, we know that angle H and angle K have what kind of relationship? And angle G and angle J have what kind of relationship? Well, they're both supplementary, right? So the measure of angle J plus the measure of angle G should add up to 180. And also, the measure of angle K plus the measure of angle H equals 180. So in order to find H, I need to know what angle K is. But I don't know angle K without that letter B. So how do I find B? Well, I can use angle J and angle G, right? So let's substitute and solve. So go ahead and try this one, and let's check our answers in a bit. So just following through that plan, finding B first using G and J, 
I get 15 for B. Plugging that in for K, K should be 81 degrees, and then using that to solve for angle H, we get 99. So we'll be practicing this in class. Again, all inscribed angles, not to be confused with central angles. Please come back to class with questions. Thanks for listening.